So uh, the question is, what about the last uh, million years or half a million years? And the best data on temperature there comes from the ice cores of Antarctica and Greenland. And uh, again, it's based mostly on oxygen isotope ratios. You can look at the little bubbles in the ice and measure the CO2 concentration in the bubbles. And you can look at the dirt in the ice and measure the amount of uh, dust that was blowing around, uh, sort of the uh, dryness of the earth at that time. It was typically very dry, very dusty during the ice ages. For, certainly for the, a few hundred thousand years, you can actually count, you know, summer, winter bands in the ice, just like you date a tree. If you go back too far in time, the bands tend to smear out and, and you need other ways to date it. I'm Richard Keene. I'm a weather and climate observer, have been for many, many years, ever since I was a kid. Uh, started professional observing in the Army in the tropics, and then later on became an observer up on the Juneau ice field. And for the past 34 years now, I've been a, quote, official National U.S. Weather Service observer for this place, Cool Creek Canyon, where we are now. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,000 years, so it works well with carbon items, life, you know, dead animals, dead trees, going back maybe 5, 10, 15,000 years. But before that, you got to rely on a longer-lived isotope, like, for example, oxygen. Oxygen-18 is heavier than oxygen-16. Therefore, the water molecule is heavier for 18 than 16, which means you're going to get more of it evaporating if the ocean is hotter. And then that carries up to Greenland or Antarctica or Baffin Island, wherever your glacier is, and gets deposited. So you can read these oxygen isotopes and get an idea of how warm the oceans were. Pretty clever, except there, there are caveats in that too. It's not one to one. Does that mean the whole oceans were warmer? No, simply what, what was the temperature of the ocean where the plume of moisture carried by the storm took it to say Baffin Island and then dropped it as snow. Some storms it may, may carry moisture from the Azores. Other storms it may carry from the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Other storms from the Gulf of Mexico. So it could be showing changes in wind patterns and storm patterns as much as temperature changes in the entire ocean. And here's something else you can't do that's very important to understanding the science about climate change. You cannot take the conditions of 5 million BC or 3 million BC and put them into one of these computer models and have it predict not just the pattern of glaciations and retreats of the glaciers, but the fact that an ice age came at all. Basically, the temperature's going along reasonably stable, given what passes for stable on planet Earth, and then suddenly, somewhere around two and a half million years ago, it goes into a precipitous decline within which it continues to oscillate unpredictably. Now, why did it do that? The oscillations within the trend, and possibly even the trend itself, could be related to various eccentricities in the orbit of the Earth, known as Milankovitch cycles, after the Serbian pioneer Milutin Milankovic. And these cycles are to do with the wobbles in the Earth's orbit and the fact that at certain periods, the planet is closer to the sun during northern hemisphere summer, and that's where most of the land mass is, so you'd get more warming. But these theories can't account for the fact that for about two million years, the glaciation interglacial cycle was a period of about 41,000 years, and then it suddenly switched to being 100,000 cycles, what's called the transition problem, indeed. And to explain after the fact, oh well, it's Milankovitch cycles, it's not the same thing as having an understanding that lets you predict in the future, or even within the known data from 5 million BC. Because it's even more important to note that it hadn't done this, despite Milankovitch cycles in the Earth's orbit, for 50 million years, and then it suddenly did it. In fact, it hadn't done it for 250 million years, and then suddenly it did it. And nobody who has the Al Gore vision can explain this. And the way they deal with it is not to talk about it. At least Prince Charles does sometimes refer to things that happened millions of years ago. And he touches on the snowball earth, which is actually hundreds of millions of years ago, well before the Cambrian explosion. But Al Gore never gets us back out of the Pleistocene. That is to say, the ice age in which the Holocene's in intermission. 
And thank goodness, because a return of the glaciers would spell genuine disaster. And again, nobody really denies that warmer periods are better for life on Earth, including the Prince of Wales, who also is not a scientist, I might add. His book says the Earth's climate has always changed, with dramatic impacts for life on our planet. Over millions of years, the Earth has varied between extremes of almost completely frozen snowball conditions and hothouse states when forests have extended into the polar regions. For the past 2.6 million years, the Earth has always had some ice at the poles. However, the climate has moved repeatedly between colder and warmer periods in a cycle tied to the naturally recurring wobbles in the orbit of the Earth as it revolves around the Sun. During the cold ice ages, large ice sheets spread over much of North America, Europe, and Asia. In between the ice ages were warmer periods with much less ice and higher sea levels, during which different kinds of plants and animals flourished. Even the iconic mastodons, uh, you know, not the woolly mammoths, the guys with the low foreheads, apparently only ventured into the Yukon and northern parts of Canada during the warmer interglacials. That's right, the really cold period sent even the hairy elephants scurrying south for warmth. 